Hello and welcome to this day in esoteric political history from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. And welcome to Good Sport Week, three episodes hooked to a big new project hosted by me. Uh, Look, we've said it on the show before, but if you write a book, you get a week. We did a week of episodes (laughs) with stories. We did a week of episodes with stories from Nikki's book. And when Kelly's next book comes out, we will do a week on that. I don't write books because writing a book seems like a terrible idea. Everyone I know who's written a book <laughs> not wrong. it's really, really hard. Um, so uh, I wouldn't want to do that. But I do make podcasts and I do have a new one. It is called Good Sport. And I will tell you a little bit more about it in a second. But here, as always, are Nicole Hammer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there and welcome to Good Sport Week. Hello and congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Hey there. I'm okay. ready to go. All right. Let's go. Um, so look, uh, Good Sport is this new series that I'm hosting. Uh, it's an eight part series. It's a narrative show. So there's, you know, reporting and lots of writing for me. And I kind of I've actually really enjoyed sort of opening up a little bit more and being a little more voicey. I'm hosting it, but it's part of um, the TED Audio Collective. And there's some brilliant producers who worked on it from Transmitter Media and Pushkin Industries and um I think people know that I have a background in sports reporting, but also kind of like it's one of these sports shows that the overall thrust is kind of that sports is a great way to understand the rest of the world and ourselves. And so most of the stories that we tell start with a question in sports, but I hope get to something more universal. And we are already getting the kind of feedback that I really love, which is that folks are like, you know, I don't like sports, but I like listening to this. And so that's music to my ears. Yeah. I'm one of those people. <laughs> um, yeah. I, mean, I think Just people saying. who know my work know that it's mostly, you know, it's like sports as a lens to get to bigger stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So look, as we did with Nikki's book when it came out, um, we're just going to pick out three stories and threads and we'll discuss them a little bit. And in this case, since it's an audio series, we're also going to play some of the episodes. So we'll talk for a little bit and then play a, a nice long chunk and hopefully you get a taste of the show and maybe you decide to go um, check it out. But the first one that we're here for um, today in our first episode of Good Sport Week is um, hooked to something fairly concrete and actually a fairly political moment that we touch on in, in one of the episodes of Good Sport. But let's go to September 28th, 2003. And that is the day that Rush Limbaugh, who is the conservative radio uh, firebrand, I guess is the right word for him. He's on ESPN and he makes a comment about Philadelphia Eagles quarterback Donovan McNabb. I happen to be an Eagles fan and a big Donovan McNabb fan. But Rush Limbaugh says that the media is not critical of McNabb enough. And that's because McNabb is black and that the media wants to see black quarterbacks succeed. And so they are in the tank for McNabb and not as hard on him as they should be. There's a lot more details here. This brings up lots of questions, um, mm. but it probably brings up one big question. And I don't know if you can guess what it is, Kelly and Nikki. What's Why is Rush Limbaugh there it is. doing Monday Night Football? Why in the world is Rush Limbaugh on ESPN no talking business. football? And you know, actually, Nikki, we didn't we didn't interview you for this episode, but we easily could have because you track conservative mm. media and so forth, and you've written a lot about Limbaugh. So, so I don't know. Can I pass the baton, so to speak, to you? Why you is Rush Limbaugh can. on Monday Night Football? And then we'll circle back around to some of the other stuff we do in, in my series. I mean, in some ways, it is a remarkable thing because Limbaugh, who had become this national figure in the 1990s, was really divisive. He was somebody who, you know, had been at the center of so many political controversies, who had said any number of racist and conspiratorial things over the years. And the idea that he would be brought into what I think many people considered kind of apolitical space, maybe wrongly considered it that, but considered it an apolitical space is is really Mm -hmm. interesting. And I think that it speaks to, uh, you know, ESPN was pitching around for big personalities who could bring in new audiences and could show in some ways that they weren't um, a liberal organization covering sports, but that they were bringing in and attending to all of their viewers who might have been more conservative. And so Rush Limbaugh could be a draw that way. And and Limbaugh himself was a huge sports fan and had been a sports Mm -hmm. announcer, a a sports host in an earlier Mm -hmm. iteration of his life before he turned to politics. I mean, to me, though, he he completely misses his audience. It's like, who do you think is listening to this right now? As though, I mean, 
I mean, I don't know a whole lot of black people that listen to Mars Lumbar, but I know a lot of black people that listen to sports. Yeah. And so, like, not being able to to rein that part in or to pivot for a different sort of demographic. I mean, I get the sort of bombasticness of Rush Limbaugh, but like this and and the mixing of his politics was just like yeah. Whoa, and I mean, no. you know, I think the spirit of the show that we made and often, you know, just sort of my approach to sports is like these should bleed into each other and I don't have a problem with like politics working its way into sports and I think sports is a great place to work out politics, but in 2003 to like pretend that you don't know what you're getting into if you invite Rush Limbaugh to come on mm. and do sports commentary mm. um you know is incredibly naive and you know yes. this is within 1 month mm-hmm. that he does it so it's like what did you expect you know like what did you expect <laughs> um you know the Rush Limbaugh thing is just a very sort of minor mention in, in the series but it is fascinating to me um in part because what Limbaugh does on here is like such a classic you know, he's like, he jumps into the world of sports, but he's really just playing the hits um, because this comment where mm. he says, oh, the media is in the tank for Donovan mm-hmm. McNabb because yeah. he's black and they are. He doesn't. The, the word woke hadn't been out there. But if he'd done this now, he would have been like, oh, yeah, the yeah. woke media oh, God, yeah. loves Donovan mm-hmm. McNabb and won't say a bad thing about a black quarterback, you know, but it's like. It is the playbook, Nikki, right? It is it is an attack on the media. It is an attack mm-hmm. on wokeness. Yep. It is this like forbidden thing that I'm saying this truth that everyone knows is true, but no one else, you know, it's just like classic. Yeah. Yeah. Back in the day, they called it political yeah. correctness. Right. And PC. Rush Limbaugh had just yeah. spent a decade railing against just that. And so now that he's on ESPN, he's able to do that. And in fact, you know, a spoiler, Rush Limbaugh does not last long on ESPN after this moment. (laughs) Um, And he would continue for the next, he lived for what, like 18 more years. Um, He would continue to talk about how he had been censored, how this, (laughs) yes. Um, Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. how um, this just showed how intolerant media organizations were and how they just Mm. couldn't hear the truth. And then also uses it as kind of like the NFL is affirmative action, which is also not great. Yeah. (laughs) Not at all. Okay, spoiler alert. There were two black quarterbacks in this past Super Bowl. But also, like, I mean, the ways in which, uh, well, that's another conversation about, like, the lack of integration in the NFL. But, you know, uh, for for him to attribute athleticism and race in that way is such an old, right. I think, trope. Um, racist trope, for that matter. But, um the fact that, you know, it, it doesn't get a lot of traction and it's like he's done very quickly um, is is was good. But at the same time, he should have never been yeah, in that. Yeah. Seat. Well, that's another way in which this is a sort of hallmark of the sort of conservative Limbaugh-esque sort of grievance game um, is that, yeah, like now there are, you know, there has been genuine progress on black quarterbacks in the NFL. McNabb was still kind of like one of the. You know, tra- a trailblazer, I think you could say. Even in mm-hmm. 2003, I think he was one of maybe the second or only third mm-hmm. ever black quarterback who ended up in the Super Bowl. Um, and that idea of, like, just the littlest bit of progress and and then this massive mm-hmm. pushback, you know, and you mm-hmm. see that in, yeah. in Limbaugh as well. Um, so, so look, uh, we're going to play a clip from Good Sport, and I should say, like, the episode that where we talk about this is really not really about Limbaugh himself, but more about this kind of larger ecosystem of sports talk and how a lot of times sports talk and the way we talk about stuff in the rest of our lives tend to mirror each other in this sense Mm -hmm. that I have in recent years, but then also there's a history here that like, gosh, you know, the divisiveness, the my team versus your team, the I'm right, Mm -hmm. you're an idiot, you know, all that stuff kind of like really... Mm -hmm is a playbook and a style of speaking in sports, but then people do translate it to politics and there's some real downsides there when we hear our politicians talking about, you know, talking about politics the way that we tend to talk about sports. Um, And Mm -hmm. so that's really what this episode kind of floats around and gets into, including also some moments where I kind of explore what it just takes to be one of these divisive figures um, and and sort of talk in this way. But, um, But yeah, I mean, I am fascinated. And Nikki, I mean, I know you you wrote about these ecosystems, but like there really is a like connection between just the sports media world and the political media world and Mm -hmm. producers float back and forth and talent float back and forth because Mm -hmm. at some level, Mm -hmm. I think I say this in the show, like at some level, it's just like, if you can get angry about something for 30 minutes, that's all that matters. And you know, whether it's Mm. tax policy or the Eagles starting quarterback, it doesn't really matter. All we need is someone to get heated. 
Yeah. Mm. I, Same thing for the yeah. real <laughs> <laughs> Next season on Somebody's Good Somebody's got to flip a table. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. <laughs> but it's everywhere. It's everywhere. The anger, the righteous indignation, that's yeah. everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Um, all right. Well, anyway, thanks to the two of you for joining us for the first episode of Good Sport Week. And here is a clip from an episode of Good Sport, the podcast, which you can then go find wherever you get your podcasts. Um, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you. Thanks, Jody. And Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. Congrats, Jody. used to hearing my voice on the world bringing you interviews from around the globe and you hear me reporting environment and climate news i'm carolyn beeler and i'm marco werman we're now with you hosting the world together more global journalism with a fresh new sound listen to the world on your local public radio station and wherever you find your podcasts i guess i'm really not cut out for this sort of thing I'm just so averse to the unimpeachable statement. I really like uncertainty, you know? A couple other thoughts on why this world isn't for everyone. For one, for Katie, let's just be honest here, it's a lot harder to do this as a woman than as a man. There's a lot of testosterone in those studios. If you decided to go full Stephen A. Smith tomorrow, you just woke up and said, okay, okay. I'm going to do this. What would the reaction be? Huh. I think I would get a lot more uh, anger and vitriol, I think, and part of that, not all of it, but part of that's because I'm a woman. Um, When you start to kind of try to go in that direction, they are like, well, we give it to them, so we're giving it to you twice as hard. Regardless, for Katie, this kind of fighting, it's just too much. I don't know. I'd probably be too tired by the third day. The real answer to your question is if I woke up tomorrow and I was going to be Stephen A by Friday, I'd be like this. I'm tired. And I would go back to being me. That's actually one of my biggest takeaways from all this, too. It just seems exhausting. Getting into character, preparing for battle, having to be dialed up to 11 all the time. What is it doing to people? What's it doing to us? I don't know that humans are built to feel this passionately about six different things every day because when you think about it that's what it is if you're filling up a show you're going to basically talk about five or six things every day and you have to you know be emotional and uh invested in all of them i know for me personally that that's a lot of things to to care about i think it's it it wears on you to constantly have to have something to say it wears on the people who have to do it And here's the thing, it may also have a larger cost for all of us, because it sends a message. If you take TV at face value, it tells you that you should be that fired up about things all the time, and that the best people who care the most about sports have opinions about every single thing every day, so much so that they have to yell about it. And so it might make somebody think it has to be something that I'm really mad about all the time. And it's like, that's not true. You can kind of sometimes just be like, yeah, I don't care about that. And this isn't just in sports. Flip to a 24-hour news channel or hop on social media. This idea that we have to be mad about everything, everywhere, all the time. Hmm. Now it seems like maybe instead of trying to get myself into this headspace, we should be trying to get more people out of it. And this could be one of those which is the chicken, which is the egg type situations. But the way that sports fans interact with each other on the internet is very intensely and with a lot of emotion, a lot of times anger that seems unwarranted and unrelated to the topic at hand. And so you have these people with this emotion who like to yell at people for their dumb takes, now yelling at people over things that are more important than that and truly matter to them. Um, That's where it became more clear to me because it was like watching us talk about other things the way we talk about sports is a mess. Yeah. Man, I feel that. I've seen that. Before my time at ESPN, I covered politics. I covered the 2016 presidential election. Oof. Bad faith takes, they are everywhere, coming from everyone. On cable news, on politics podcasts, on blue wave Twitter and MAGA Twitter. 
and the incentives to behave this way are real. For a shout guy on TV, it's a big contract. For a keyboard warrior or a barstool blowhard, it's more and more likes and shares. For a presidential candidate, it's a few thousand votes in Wisconsin. And that's got me worried. I'm worried. I think most people are rational and calm. But when we're in the wrong environment, the better angels of our nature take a backseat. Especially when everything we see on TV or from our politicians is modeling the worst possible behavior. That's the environment we're in right now, full of cacophony and speed and meanness. To me, it all just kind of feels like sports talk. And the thing is, there's a history here, an actual connection you can trace. The world of sports talk and the world of news and politics talk are deeply intertwined, especially over the last 40 years or so. We didn't get here by accident. As they say on TV, that's after the break. That's a taste of the new show, Good Sport. Subscribe and follow wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Our producer is Brittany Brown. Our transcripts, which you can find on our website, are done by Kala Nakua. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, creator-owned, listener-supported podcasts. Audrey Mardovich, executive producer. Yuri Lasordo, director of operations. Thanks to all of you who support this show by being members of Radiotopia. Find transcripts, sign up for our newsletter, find us on social, suggest topics, all that and more at our website, thisdaypod.com. See you soon. Radio Tokyo.